here at Seattle Atheist Church, the members ourselves give many of the talks. And we do have a planning meeting once a quarter that's open to the whole community. Uh, that means you, if you're here, you're invited. And today, please join us in welcoming Eva. You can unmute your mic maybe and give her a, some applause. She's going to talk about TM Scanlon and the good place. Um, here we go. Okay, so um, I have just spent the last couple of weeks reading this book, and it took me that long. Um, this book is one, it's a T.M. Scanlon's What We Owe to Each Other. It's a, it's a book on ethical philosophy. Um, and the reason that I was interested in reading this book, the reason I heard of it at all, is that it featured in the popular comedy, The Good Place. I love The Good Place. It is fantastic. It's funny. It's entertaining. It's also, remarkably, an exploration of ethical philosophy that's well worth engaging in. So go see The Good Place. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend reading this whole book. Um, the reason that it's connected to The Good Place is that... Um, they, the writer, uh, Michael Schur, actually read this book and was so struck by its arguments that he incorporated them into kind of the essence of The Good Place, not just the plot, but kind of what it's about. Um, because ultimately, The Good Place is about ethics. Um, and it explores things like the trolley problem. It's got a whole episode dedicated to the pro trolley problem. Um, it gets into some criticism of utilitarianism. Um, it gets into um, how much we blame people who maybe can't help being bad people, things like that. Um, and all of that is addressed in some way in this book, but this book is not actually fun to read. Um, it, was, it was really hard going. Um, I've enjoyed big fat um, philosophy of ethics books in the past. Some of you will remember I gave a talk on Derek Parfit's Reasons and Persons a few years ago. Um, Parfit uh, corresponded with Scanlon as he was writing this book, apparently. Parfit and Scanlon are both named in the show, um, as is Peter Singer, as is Kant. Uh, there are a whole bunch of philosophers invoked in the course of the show, which nonetheless manages to be a really fun show. So don't read the book, just see my talk and then go see the show and then have conversations with your friends and family about ethics um, because not everyone should be subjected to this book. But let me share some of what I got out of it with you and how I kind of related that to some other things that I've seen and heard and thought about. Um, so the core of the book is the argument that morality is ultimately based not on well-being, which some philosophers have based it on, or on fulfilling our desires, as some people have based it on, but on acting in ways we can justify to others. So not specific rules, but being able to justify our actions by reasons that other people couldn't reasonably reject. Um, we don't have to have all of the rules figured out in advance, and we don't all have to have the same principles, but we should, for any action we take, be able to say, hey, it's okay that I did that because this principle. And people we say that to who are involved in the situation should go, okay, that makes sense. You know, Even if I don't like the effect on me, I can see that that rule is fair and applies, and I would want it to apply to me if I were in your situation, so I accept that. So that's the essential argument in this book. Um, he, he goes a lot of directions with it, does a lot of building up of that argument. Um, if you're looking for specific rules for behavior, you're not going to find them in this book. And if you're looking for a logical basis for making all of your own principles, you're also not going to find that in this book. Um, this is neither a formal rule system for ethics, nor a rule set for ethics. It is a description of how we think about ethics usually um, and what we should take into account as we're doing that. 
Um, so let me build up some of the pieces of this. Uh, reasons are core to morality. Um, we can be held responsible to have good reasons for our beliefs, our actions, our intentions, our statements, um, and our attitudes. Uh, beliefs, attitudes, intentions, statements, voluntary actions. I think there's something in there I hadn't said. Um, Scanlon categorizes all these things that are sub subject to moral judgment as judgment-sensitive attitudes. There are some things we do that can't be judged. If I sneeze, I can't be judged for that. That was accidental. It was not under my control. If somebody pushes me and I bump into somebody, that's not my responsibility. Things like that, we are not responsible to have good reasons for. Maybe we have ways to avoid them, but that's kind of a separate argument. Um, we are not held responsible to be ideally rational. Um, being ideally rational would mean always making the best possible decision in every situation. Humans can't actually do that because we don't have the full information at all times and we don't have perfect reasoning. We might make the wrong decision even if we have the information. But we are responsible to be reasonable. Um, and reasonable means we are taking people's interests into account and uh, weighing them according to some kind of argument we can justify. Doesn't mean we did it perfectly, doesn't mean everyone would agree with us in every detail, but we should have reasons that people would go, okay, yeah, that's an important reason, and no, this other thing doesn't disqualify you from considering that reason. So when we say someone's being unreasonable, we usually mean they're failing to take other people's interests appropriately into account. Um, and that is assuming a common goal of reaching agreement, an agreement or a mutually satisfying course of action. We assume that about the people around us. We normally take that stance and we assume it of others. Um, Scanlon does not take desire as being core to morality. He says it might motivate us to act, but we still make a decision about which desires to act on. And we might act on something we don't have a desire to do at all. We just see ourselves as having a duty. Um, and so desire isn't really the core thing. Um, desires might come from experiential states like being thirsty or hungry. We might see a need, make a decision, and then have a desire to fulfill it. So basically the desire is not the core thing. It's not the source of the decision to do something. So he disqualifies that from being central. That's why he takes reasons as central. Uh, it's a better explanation. Reasons are not just weighed by strength and, and tallied and compared. They are considered in relationship to one another and the context. They may conflict with each other. They may support each other. Um, they may be reasons for wanting incompatible things. They might stand on their own, even if another reason wins, that reason might still stand, or the reason that wins might disqualify them from even being considered. No, you can't consider that reason because this other one is standing. Um, you can't consider that this would be inconvenient to you because we're talking about someone's life. You know, your inconvenience doesn't even come into it, that kind of disqualification. Um, when we consider reasons, we consider which ones are relevant um, for the situation. For example, if we're playing a game, we need to decide what stance we're playing that game from. Are we just having fun with a friend? Are we teaching a child how to how to uh, have good sportsmanship? Are we in the world championship and we should play absolutely ruthlessly against a peer? Um, there, there are very different ways to play a game. Once we've decided what stance we're playing from, that leads to smaller decisions like, do I make this play or that play? How hard do I push this person in a soccer game or whatever? Um, much of our practical thinking is concerned with figuring out which reasons are relevant. So we are constantly interpreting, adjusting, and modifying our structure of reasons and how they support or disqualify each other. That's, that's what the process is, is thinking, wait, is this important now or is this more important now? Is this, does this reason even matter in this situation? Um, Sometimes something might seem to be a reason, but we realize that under the circumstances actually isn't a reason after all. 
Um, so reasons are core. Um, values are not, thing value of something is not a quality in itself. It derives from qualities of the thing. For example, and most important example, the value of a human life is not, here's a human and it's alive. The value of a human life, the essence of being a human who is alive is being a rational being treated like a rational being. So when we talk about valuing human lives, we're not saying, oh, we should have more babies because having more human lives in the world is a positive good in itself. No, we're talking about the human lives who are here and the human lives that will exist in the future should all be treated with respect to their being rational beings with choices and interests. So that's the stance we're coming from in valuing human life. That's also the kind of value other things have. For instance, the value of friendship. Friendship has value to us. You know, if I have a friend that has some benefits for me, like I have somebody who'll have my back and I have somebody who I can go to to talk about something, I have a companion, but those are not the value of friendship. The value of friendship is in being a friend. The things that we get out of friendship come naturally from the process of being a friend, and that is what we should value. If I choose to have a friend so that I can get the benefits of friendship without valuing my friend's interests, I am not being a good friend. In fact, even if I value my friend because I like them and I like their company, but I don't value other human beings, I'm still not being a good friend. If I would kill someone to get their kidney to save my friend, my friend cannot count on my friendship. They can count on, I'll kill someone for them, but that's only because they're my friend. If they were not my friend, their kidney might be up for grabs. So we can't actually count on someone who does not take into account the interests of other human beings, even if they are conditionally considering our interests because they like us right now. Um, so that's kind of an example of how valuing the nature of humans and also valuing the nature of friendship is the core of morality. It's not about what you can get out of it or uh, conditional values. It's looking at the nature of the thing you're valuing, how it is to be valued. Friendship is not simply to be valued a certain level. It is to be valued in a certain way. Um, similarly, if you are a scientist, the point of science is to use certain methodical approaches to gain a better understanding of the truth of the world. If I value science, I cannot further science by lying about my results or cheating my peers or silencing opponents' arguments. That is not how science works. That is not how to value science. I am being a bad scientist. I am not furthering science if I do those things even if it's to further my own scientific conclusions that I think are right. I'm not doing it. So in order to value something correctly, we have to engage in the nature of that thing and why it is valuable. It's not valuable in a vacuum. It's valuable for reasons. And to value it appropriately, we need to engage with those reasons and support those reasons and the process that they involve. Um, we consider not caring about right and wrong and not valuing the interests of other human beings a really serious personal flaw. It's a more serious flaw than not valuing other kinds of things or not being good at other kinds of things. Um, I've got a, uh, a tweet here. Let me share my screen if I can figure out how to do that. I want to share this tweet. Um, so the writer Lauren Morrill just posted this tweet. My biggest problem in these ACA debates, I don't know how to explain to you why you should care about other people. Ultimately, that's not something that we can explain if people don't already accept it. 
someone who does not accept the fundamental principle that other humans are entities whose interests we need to support and care about and consider in our decisions isn't someone we can negotiate with. They're not someone we can engage with as rational beings um, because they're not sharing that very fundamental ground. Um, So there, there are people who don't have this ability. There are sociopaths. Um, There are people who, because of their upbringing, have not learned how to take other people's interests into account. Um, The the way this is phrased in uh, Star Trek, um, the character Quark uh, is of a culture that values uh, financial gain and, uh, you know, cleverness in like cheating people and so on as like the most important thing. But at one point, he criticizes somebody for immoral behavior. And when he's asked why, he says they failed to take to place an appropriately high value on repeat business, which is a very self-interested way of talking about this. Um, it's not the one that Scanlon sets up, but it is, uh, it is a way it works in the world. If we don't place an appropriately high value on repeat business, that is by considering the interests of other people and making them want to come back and deal with us again, then we are disqualifying ourselves from social engagement. People will not want to deal with us because they can't rely on our word. They can't rely on us to be even decent. Um, I've got another quote here from a, a Terry Pratchett book. Let me get this up here. It takes me a second to swap things around on my screen. Um, but there is a, uh, there's a character named Granny Weatherwax throughout, throughout a number of Terry Pratchett's Discworld books. And this is a quote from her. She's talking to a priest of the, the god uh, Omnia, I think. Um, there's a very interesting debate raging at the moment about the nature of sin, for example, said Oates. That's the priest. Um, and, what do they, and what do they think? against it are they said granny weatherwax it's not as simple as that it's not a black and white issue there are so many shades of gray nope pardon there's no grays only white that's got grubby i'm surprised you don't know that and sin young man is when you treat people as things including yourself that's what sin is it's a lot more complicated than that no it ain't when people say things are a lot more complicated than that that means they're getting worried that they won't like the truth People as things, that's where it starts. Oh, I'm sure there are worse crimes, but they starts with thinking about people as things. And that is kind of the core of how Scanlon is thinking about this. Because if we are treating people as rational beings, we will take their interests into account in our decisions and actions. And if we don't treat them as rational beings, if they're just instruments or resources for us to use, We're treating them as things. And that leads to things like slavery and abuse and violence and neglect and any number of evils. So Granny Weatherwax and Pratchett are right at the core of this right here. Um, So let me see, next bit. Uh, So question here, is it fair to judge someone for bad actions if they can't help acting that way? So they're a sociopath, they've been raised badly, whatever. Yes, it's fair to judge them. It's fair to criticize the behavior, but that doesn't mean that they should be punished or even not helped. Um, Scanlon's position on this is no one should be harmed. So if we think someone deserves harm because they did harm, we're wrong. And if we think we shouldn't help someone because they did harm, we're also wrong. We're not obligated to take on un, unreasonable levels of risk and helping someone who is dangerous might involve unreasonable levels of risk, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't try to help when we can. Um, there's a song from West Side Story, Officer Krupke. If you've seen the musical, uh, the song Officer Krupke is really fun, but it also kind of gets at some social issues. 
It's being sung by a police officer and a gang of juvenile delinquents, and they're singing back and forth. And the essential problem is these delinquents create bad behavior. They commit crimes. They harm people. The police officer arrests them and ends up being told, oh, well, you know, they're like this because they have psychological problems. And then the judge says, okay, well, then we shouldn't send them to jail. We should get them psychological help. And the psychologist says, oh, well, they have these psychological problems because they've been socially deprived. So we should get them some social, we, we should get a, a social worker. And the social worker is handed a criminal who is not prepared to be out in public in society doing a job and doesn't feel any obligation to participate in society. And so there's no, there's no point at which the, the youths are either, uh, there's no point at which the problem is being solved. The problem is they have this terrible behavior and they're also in these terrible situations, but nobody's solving those problems. They're just saying, well, where's the responsibility? That's not a useful question if you're not addressing the problems. So yes, they're responsible for their behavior, but also let's help them solve their problems and help them find better solutions. Um, then he also talks about how, how these principles commit us to particular uh, kinds of behavior. For instance, why should we keep our promises? And he brings it down to we should keep promises and avoid lying because the obligation not to mislead people to their cost is a principle no one can reasonably reject. We want to be able to rely on one another. We want to be able to assure one another of our intent so that we can count on someone's help and know they can count on our help and we can cooperate in our efforts. These are reasonable things to want and committing ourselves to keep our promises, except with certain exceptions, um, is a reasonable limitation in order to gain that. We do allow for reasonable exemptions from keeping promises if someone's been coerced, um, if someone was misled, they made their promise on, on false understanding, or if there are unexpectedly direly high costs to their keeping their promise. I had no idea when I made this promise that it would be this hard to do. I really can't do it now. Um, but without those kinds of exceptions, we expect people to keep their promises and we feel that we have the right to expect them to keep their promises. We also feel other people have the right to expect us to keep our promises. So there is this reciprocality. We agree on the principle. We might disagree on how the specifics apply. Is this cost high enough that it exempts me from keeping this promise? That, that is available for discussion. But because we agree on the principle, we agree that promises are a thing. That if I say I'm going to do something and my not doing it would hurt you, I should do it. Um, there's an example in the show, The Good Place, where we kind of get a sense of who Eleanor was. Eleanor is one of the main characters, kind of the core main character. Um, we see who she was in her life. And she was incredibly selfish. Um, we see her agree to be the designated driver for her friends and then go ahead and drink. So she doesn't even tell them that she's changed her mind. So they're still drinking, assuming that they're going to have a driver and they don't. So she's reneged on this promise. She has left them in a difficult, and possibly even dangerous situation for no better argument than, oh, that was inconvenient to me. I'd rather drink. Um, so it's kind of a, an exemplar of selfish behavior that doesn't take other people's interests appropriately into account and disqualifies you from consideration. Like who would want to deal with such a person? If somebody treated you like that, you would not want to be their friend anymore. You wouldn't want to go out drinking with them because they're not going to hold up their end. Um, so that's kind of the core of Scanlon's talk. Um, he says that there are some principles that societies in general will agree on. Um, somewhere the same problem is addressed in different ways in different societies. Like we, we all have to deal with the same problem of, you know, how do we take care of children or uh, what is the role of marriage, et cetera. But societies can come up with different solutions that are still morally justifiable. Um, and then there are also 
situations, issues where even individuals within the same society will disagree depending on which values they hold take precedence. Um, as long as there's some common ground, you can have some kind of relationship with a person. If they don't accept the interests of others as a consideration though, there's no ground for a relationship. We can't find footing for someone who doesn't consider our interests at all. Um, so as a final thought here, I wanted to uh, actually bring something uh, that my husband Mickey came up with, which is he had this thought a while back that was kind of uh, discouraging that when we think about good and evil, evil kind of has all the tools and weapons. It has the advantage because evil people do not have to disqualify any possible actions on moral grounds. They can do anything, whatever they think might be advantageous at the given time. Um, they don't have to rule something out just because it would harm a bunch of people. So how can good ever win under those circumstances? How can we possibly win when the bad guys can do anything to beat us? And he thought about this and he realized that there is one tool that evil people do not have access to that good people do. And that tool is the fact that people who are of good faith, who take each other's interests into account, have trust. We therefore have cooperation. If you take other people's interests into account, then other people who take other people's interests into account will see that and be able to work with you. And we can all work together and then we can beat the bad guys. And it's happened over and over and over again, even though evil has access to all the tools because they don't rule anything out for ethical reasons. Good people have the advantage of cooperation and trust. We don't have to simultaneously watch our own backs from our companions while we're fighting the other side. And because we can do that, love is stronger. Love wins. So that's what I got out of this book. It's not necessarily what everyone would get out of this book. Um, but my final, my final point to you is uh, watch The Good Place, see what Michael Schur got out of the book, um, and go have ethical conversations with your friends and loved ones. See what common grounds you have, because it's really interesting. And it's what we have as people who take each other's interests into account, is that constant negotiation of each other's interests so that we can make a society. <laughs> Thank you, Eva. Can people please unmute their microphones so we can give her a round of applause? Nice work.